Hello, and welcome to The Space Above Us. Episode 2, Before the Rise of Mercury. While the main thrust of this podcast is to examine the history of NASA human spaceflight, I feel it would be doing you, the listener, a disservice to not at least touch on some of the history of rocketry, the unmanned flights that preceded Project Mercury, and some of the project history before the first manned flight. The origins of NASA's manned spaceflight program is a complex story involving technological pioneers ahead of their time, competition between military services, world wars, national pride, and political jockeying. It's a fascinating story, but one which is far too complex and involves far too few space flights for me to cover it in the detail it deserves. At the same time, it is crucial to have at least some understanding of the context in which the rest of our story will be taking place. With that said, let's get into an abridged tour of the build-up to Project Mercury. It seems to be a time-honored tradition in spaceflight histories to spend at least a few sentences talking about ancient rocketry, so I figured I'd better do my part. In the 9th century, gunpowder was invented in China. This volatile powder was composed of charcoal, sulfur, and saltpeter, otherwise known as potassium nitrate. What made gunpowder so effective was the fact that it contained an oxidizer, meaning its reaction was not limited by the rate at which it could pull in oxygen from the air surrounding it. This made the reactions happen extremely rapidly, rapidly enough to propel projectiles at whoever you don't like. In the 13th century, the Chinese military began stuffing gunpowder into long tubes to create an early form of rockets, which they used in battle against the Mongols. These rockets were powerful enough to cause a fair amount of destruction, spreading shrapnel as far as 2,000 feet away from the point of impact, but were most useful for their psychological impact. If you were a soldier in the Mongol army, I'm sure you would have no idea what the heck is going on, but would have an idea that you wanted to be somewhere else. Skipping forward a few hundred years, we get to the founding fathers of modern rocketry, Tsiolkovsky, Obert, and Goddard. As with founding fathers in all fields, these pioneers are not solely responsible for the creation and modern use of rockets, but their contributions stand out in particular, and since it appears that all three were unaware of each other's work, they generally all get credit for founding the field. Konstantin Tsiolkovsky was born on September 17th, 1857, in a Russian town I cannot hope to pronounce. As a child, he was interested in mathematics and science, and became a teacher in the much easier to pronounce town of Kaluga. Jules Verne was a contemporary of Tsiolkovsky, and his books inspired him to write his own science fiction stories. Eventually, these science fiction stories became more and more detailed, until he had transitioned into writing technical papers on the problems of rocket control, liquid propellants, gyroscopes, and so on. Two of his most well-known publications were Investigations of Outer Space by Rocket Devices and Aims of Astronauts, published in 1911 and 1914 respectively. Tsiolkovsky was never able to bring his concepts to fruition, but his work laid much of the theoretical foundation for the space revolution to come. His work was largely unknown in the West, but he had a huge influence on the Russian scientists and engineers that went on to found that country's space program. Hermann Obert, I think I'm pronouncing that right, was born on June 25, 1894, in what is now Romania, but what was then Transylvania. Like Tsiolkovsky, he was also a fan of the works of Jules Verne, and was inspired to investigate the mathematics and physics behind rocketry. He served in World War I as part of a medical unit, and even continued his work while on the battlefield, developing designs for a liquid-fueled missile with a range of nearly 300 kilometers. Thankfully, none of his commanding officers saw much potential in the weapon. After the war, he returned to his studies in physics, focusing on the possible use of liquid rocket fuel. He also realized the potential of multiple rocket stages. He wrote, quote, If there is a small rocket on top of a big one, and if the big one is jettisoned and the small one is ignited, then their speeds are added. This, of course, is a fundamental concept used in rocketry to this day. He published a book titled The Rocket into Planetary Space, which gained him recognition for his explanations of how liquid-fueled rockets could be used to escape the Earth's gravitational pull. He went on to construct and eventually fly a liquid-fueled rocket in 1931. He was assisted in this effort by young Werner von Braun, the future mastermind behind the Saturn V rocket. In 
The first flight of a liquid-fueled rocket was performed by Robert Goddard in 1926. At the time, Goddard was a professor at Clark University, my alma mater, in Worcester, Massachusetts. After many experiments with various aspects of solid-fueled rockets, he began work on the far more difficult problem of liquid-fueled engines. Liquid-fueled engines have a number of benefits over solid fuel, not the least of which is that it's possible to turn them off. His rocket used gasoline as the fuel and liquid oxygen as the oxidizer, and was somewhat unusual in that it placed the combustion chamber and exhaust nozzle at the top of the vehicle, with the fuel and oxidizer at the bottom. This was an attempt to make the vehicle more stable, but later experiments proved it made no difference. Goddard's first rocket flew in Auburn, Massachusetts, near Worcester, at his aunt's farm. The two and a half second flight only rose about 40 feet in the air, but flew 184 feet away from the launch site. That's 64 feet further than the Wright Flyer went on its first flight, so take that, Wright brothers. Goddard went on to perform a number of flights with different experimental rockets, eventually achieving a flight over 8,000 feet in altitude in 1937. Somewhat surprisingly, the value of rocketry was never really grasped until World War II when the Germans realized, hey, you could probably stick a bomb on top of that thing, and began the infamous V-2 program. The V-2 program, under the management of legendary rocket designer and Obert mentee Werner von Braun, created the world's first guided ballistic missiles. Each rocket was about 46 feet tall, higher than the entire first flight of Goddard's rocket 18 years earlier, and was capable of carrying a 1,000 kilogram warhead over 300 kilometers. They were used by the Nazi regime to bombard England from long distances, and traveled at such high speeds that they were impossible to defend against. Luckily for the rest of the world, V-2 development started late in the war and was not able to make a large impact before Germany surrendered. After the end of World War II, von Braun and several of his colleagues came to the United States to work on the fledgling rocket program of the United States Army. It was the Army, and not the Air Force, that acquired von Braun's group because rather than viewing rocketry in the same vein as aviation, it was viewed as a sort of super artillery. They soon put the group to work on a modified version of their V-2, which eventually morphed into the missile we will soon come to know and love, the Redstone. We'll be talking more about the Redstone soon, but briefly, it was a 70-foot tall, 6-foot wide missile powered by alcohol and liquid oxygen. It generated 75,000 pounds of thrust, used an inertial guidance system on a gyroscopically stabilized platform, and traveled at over 3,800 miles per hour after engine shutdown. While von Braun and his team of engineers toiled away on the Redstone for the United States Army, researchers around the country focused on the core problems of aviation under the umbrella of the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, or NACA. NACA was the predecessor to NASA, and was dedicated to performing fundamental aeronautics research. Mostly shying away from the engineering and operations side of actually building and flying aircraft, NACA's efforts resulted in data on the performance of various airfoils, the behavior of vehicles traveling at supersonic speeds, engine cowls, and other building blocks of modern aviation. NACA's researchers were split among its four facilities, Langley Memorial Aeronautical Laboratory in Hampton, Virginia, Ames Aeronautical Laboratory at Moffett Field, the Aircraft Engine Research Laboratory at the Lewis Research Center, and the Morak Flight Test Unit at Edwards Air Force Base. These facilities were largely independent, with NACA headquarters exerting only a light touch on their activities. This independence led to the somewhat contentious organizational structure of NASA, which made a more concerted effort to steer the agency's goals. The critical event that sparked what would go on to become the space race was, of course, the launching of Sputnik by the Soviet Union on October 4th, 1957. Sputnik, which by the way is Russian for traveling companion, was a metallic spherical satellite about 23 inches across and about 184 pounds in weight. Attached to the sphere were four long antennae that allowed communication with the ground. The spacecraft's famous beep-beep broadcast signal contained encoded information about the temperature and pressure on board the vehicle and allowed amateur radio operators all around the world to easily track it. Additionally, with its shiny polished exterior, it was quite easy to spot in the night skies under the right lighting conditions. 
I think the fact that an average American could walk outside and use their naked eye to see this symbol of Soviet technological achievement flying over their town greatly contributed to the impact of the event. The event was shocking to Americans, since it was assumed that we had a comfortable lead in technology. This was simultaneously an indication that the Soviets were further along than we thought, and that we weren't as far as we thought. Sputnik itself was completely benign, but if the Russians could launch benign beeping beach balls over the heads of middle America, they could also launch far less benign objects. Two months after Sputnik, the United States made its first pitiful attempt to launch a satellite atop a Navy Vanguard rocket, but the vehicle failed almost immediately. However, on January 31st, 1958, an American satellite was finally launched on a Juno rocket. The rocket was a derivative of the Redstone missile that Von Braun and his team had been developing for the Army. The American satellite, Explorer 1, was the spacecraft that first detected the Van Allen radiation belt, a major scientific discovery right off the bat. The first orbital launch attempts were carried out by the Navy and the Army, and not NASA, because at the time NASA didn't yet exist. It was assumed by many that any space program would be under the jurisdiction of the military, I guess going with the idea that anything that involves big explosions is a military thing. Of course, the branches of the military don't always get along, so that was a little problematic. I'm skipping over a lot of details here, but the Army, Navy, and Air Force each had their own rocket programs and their own ideas on the possibility of launching a man into orbit. In July 1958, NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, was formed by President Eisenhower in order to have a single civilian administration responsible for the exploration of space. It would absorb NACA shortly afterwards. While NASA would continue to work cooperatively with the military, the task of launching a human into orbit was under civilian management. In September of that year, NASA and ARPA, the Advanced Research Projects Agency, created the Joint Manned Satellite Panel to begin the work of starting a manned spaceflight program. A month later, the panel released a report that describes what would go on to become Project Mercury. Here's an excerpt from the report, titled, Objectives and Basic Plan for the Manned Satellite Project. Objectives. The objectives of the project are to achieve at the earliest practicable date orbital flight and successful recovery of a manned satellite, and to investigate the capabilities of man in this environment. Mission. To accomplish these objectives, the most reliable available boost system will be used. A nearly circular orbit will be established at an altitude sufficiently high to permit a 24-hour satellite lifetime. However, the number of orbital cycles is arbitrary. Descent from orbit will be initiated by the application of retrothrust. Parachutes will be deployed after the vehicle has been slowed down by aerodynamic drag, and recovery on land or water will be possible. Configuration. The vehicle will be a ballistic capsule with high aerodynamic drag. It should be statically stable over the Mach number range corresponding to flight within the atmosphere. Structurally, the capsule will be designed to withstand any combination of acceleration, heat loads, and aerodynamic forces that might occur during the boost and re-entry of successful or aborted missions. This high-level summary accurately describes the overall Project Mercury configuration that would finally fly three years later. Early specifications for the capsule and systems were sent to over 40 companies in late October, with 38 signaling their interest in bidding on the project. By December, the list was down to 11. Avco, Convair Astronautics, Lockheed, Martin, still separate companies, McDonnell, North American, Northrop, Republic, Douglas, Grumman, and Chance Vaught. After weeks of winnowing down the field, there remained two finalists, Grumman Aircraft Engineering Corporation and McDonnell Aircraft Corporation. Citing qualms about Grumman's commitment to early Navy projects and potential lack of manpower, NASA awarded the capsule contract to McDonnell. The initial contract was for a cost of $18,300,000 with a fee of $1,150,000. It would not remain at that level for long. With the capsule contract decided, and the booster choice made by necessity, the Atlas rocket was the only one that could carry the required payload, it was time to go shopping for astronauts. The initial plan was to seek out 150 candidates from industry and the military, choose 36 to go on to physical and psychological testing, 
12 from that group to go through 9 months of training and qualification, and finally choose 6 from the remaining group to become astronauts. The original requirements cast a wider net than you might expect. Candidates were required to be males between 25 and 40, less than 5 feet 11 inches, have obtained at least a bachelor's degree level education, and align with one of several career types that were essentially looking for advanced researchers, pilots, navigators, engineers, and doctors. They needed to be able to prove that they had demonstrated their, quote, willingness to accept hazards comparable to those encountered in modern research airplane flight, capacity to tolerate rigorous and severe environmental conditions, and ability to react under conditions of stress or emergency. None of that mattered, though, since President Eisenhower decided that the existing group of military test pilots was the perfect place to look for astronauts. They already had the required experience and could satisfy any security requirements. So the initial astronauts would all be military test pilots, but the original requirements bear a resemblance to the requirements issued when the time came to seek astronauts for the new space shuttle program years later. 110 men met the minimum requirements specified by NASA. They were divided into three arbitrary groups, and the first group was invited to Washington in February 1959 to begin interviews. The results were so positive that NASA decided not to send invitations to the third group. Bummer, guys. By the beginning of March, the 69 men who arrived in Washington had been filtered down to 36. 32 opted to continue and participate in the extreme physical examination that has become a stereotype in every astronaut movie. Over the course of a week in Albuquerque, New Mexico, each man was examined in just about every way science knew how to examine a human at that point. Somewhat surprisingly, this process only filtered out one man. I guess military test pilots are a pretty healthy bunch. After the medical exams, the astronaut candidates faced a series of physical and psychological stress tests. Blowing up balloons, running on treadmills, spinning in centrifuges, vibration, tilt tables, they did it all. And during all this, they were participating in 13 different psychological tests, studying how they reacted to situations, their personalities, their motivations, and so on. After all this, NASA still had too much trouble cutting the final field down to six, so invitations were offered to seven finalists, asking if they wished to be Mercury astronauts. They did. Alan Shepard, Gus Grissom, John Glenn, Scott Carpenter, Wally Shira, Gordon Cooper, and Deke Slayton became household names and mega-celebrities overnight. America had its first astronauts. It was time to get them into space. Thanks for listening to The Space Above Us. If you have any questions, comments, or feedback, please email me at jp at thespaceabove.us or via Twitter at the username at spaceaboveus. We also have the Facebook page, facebook.com slash thespaceaboveus. In the next episode, we'll talk about NASA's first manned spaceflight, Freedom 7. Ad Astra, catch you on the next pass. Pass.